The broadcast is now starting. <clears throat> All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. My name is Andrew Capehart with WRMA and the APS Technical Assistance Resource Center. Uh, welcome to the webinar. The title of today's webinar is, If It Is Not Documented, It Is Not Done. And I'll introduce our speaker here shortly. Uh, next slide. Quick disclaimer before we get started, the Adult Protective Services Technical Assistance Resource Center, or APS TARC, is a project of the U.S. Administration for Community Living, Administration on Aging, Department of Health and Human Services, administered by WRMA Incorporated. The contractor's findings, conclusions, and points of view do not necessarily represent the official policy of the federal government. Um, next slide. A quick note about our APS TARC. We are here to help you uh, with your APS program in any way that we can. Just reach out to us. Um, we're going to have some contact information displayed at the end of the webinar, so you'll see our web address and our email address. Uh, we work to enhance the effectiveness of APS programs by working with partners on use of data and analytics, uh, applying research and evaluation to practice, and encouraging the use of innovative practices and strategies. Uh, next slide. So a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, this session is being recorded. We want everyone to know that. It will be posted to the web at a later date, and we'll notify all the attendees and the people who registered via email when it is posted online and available to watch. You may use your telephone or your computer to connect to audio. Just select the option that you prefer on your GoToWebinar control panel. We have an example of that displayed here. It's circled where you can make that selection if you want to switch back and forth between the two of them. Um, and all participants are muted for this webinar, so there's no need to mute your line manually. Uh, next slide. So if you have any questions of our presenter, simply type them in the questions box. There's an example here of where to type those on this slide. It's circled in purple. You don't have to wait until we pause for questions to submit um, your questions. You can type them anytime you like, and then I will relay them to our speaker when it's time for Q&A at the end of the presentation. And also, if you want to download a copy of today's slides, they're available now under the handout section of your GoToWebinar control panel. You'll see a little section there. You just click on the title and you'll be able to download a PDF copy of the slides. Uh, next slide. So now a quick poll to get the feel for the makeup of our audience. I'm going to launch this poll now and you can vote by clicking directly on your screen. Um, which of the following categories do you identify the most with? Are you um, an adult protective services professional? other social services professional, medical, legal, or other. So if you just click on your screen, um, you can make that selection. We do this so we have an idea of the folks that are attending. And it looks like we have some results rolling in. We're gonna keep this open for just a little bit longer, maybe 10, 15 more seconds to give folks a chance to vote. And again, you just click right on your screen. Um, to make your selection and let us know which of these categories make the most sense for you professionally. Give it about five more seconds and close the poll out. So I'm gonna close that poll and then share the results with everybody. So it looks like overwhelmingly 83% of the folks on the line identify as social services. And then we have 12% other social services um, and then 1%, 1%, 4% other for medical, legal, and other. Thanks for doing that poll. And I'm going to hide that poll now. We'll go back to our slides. Um, so uh, next slide. I would like to introduce today's speaker, um, which is Dr. Heather Stowe. Uh, Dr. Stowe is a native of Scotland in the UK, has lived in practice as a licensed clinical social worker in the Washington DC area for over 20 years. Dr. Stowe is considered an expert in trauma, mental health, and protective services. She teaches at the graduate level, and her publications include Trauma Recovery Skills Manual, a workbook co-written with the staff at Community Connections to help clinicians work effectively with mentally ill female trauma survivors, and a social skills approach to trauma recovery for women diagnosed with serious mental illness in working with the mentally ill trauma survivor. She's a founding board member of the Prince George's County Human Services Coalition and a past commissioner with the Prince George's County Commission for Individuals with Disabilities. She has consulted nationally on system implementation training for child and adult services. Dr. Stowe has a significant experience in child welfare, mental health and gerontology, and prior to her current position was the principal deputy director at the, C at the DC Child and Family Services Agency. 
She currently serves as a clinical director for the District of Columbia Department on Aging and Community Living. In this role, she's responsible for providing clinical leadership to the agency. Uh, Dr. Stowe earned a master's degree in English language and literature from Glasgow University in Scotland, and a master in social work and doctor of philosophy degrees from Howard University in Washington, DC. And I think we are very fortunate to have Dr. Stowe present for us today. And I will turn things over to you, Dr. Stowe. Thank you, Andy, I appreciate that. Um, I'd like to say good afternoon to all of my colleagues who are joining me today and sharing this time. I think it demonstrates that this is an important topic that cuts across our practice areas and um, I think where many of us still struggle to find a balance between being overly prescriptive and just letting everybody do their own thing. So, next slide. This is really the question. Why document? Many of my social workers still ask me that on a fairly regular basis. Um, and hopefully as we go through the, the rest of our time together, um, I'll give you some ideas on uh, what, how you can ans answer that question if, uh, uh, if you get asked about it. So why document? Next slide, please. Documentation is key to our clinical practice. Um, along with documentation, we're really talking about critical thinking skills and how we convey to others what we're doing, how we're doing it, and what the results of our interventions might be. Documentation is really telling our story. And it's, it's essential on so many different levels most critically because it helps us in our work with the individual in front of us. It helps us organize our thoughts, it helps us organize our work, and it helps us develop an intervention that allows us to provide an effective service in as timely a way as possible. Um, I'm very clear, having worked for government for many years, that I believe that government should only be involved with people's lives for as, for as short a period as is absolutely necessary. And I do think that good documentation helps us to move folks along in the process and um, allows us to, to really see what we're doing uh, and how we're doing it. And then on a more macro level, of course, the information that we get from that documentation allows us to think about our services, the way in which we're providing services, and does anything need to uh, change in the way in which we are working? Next slide. Quality documentation is in the best interest of the client and the worker. Writing a record of our planning, our intervention, and our critical judgment supports the social worker over time. It really is, it's such a key area of practice, and yet I think it's one that is often considered as an afterthought as an adjunct to the actual direct service work or the face-to-face -face work, as opposed to thinking about it as something which facilitates critical thinking in our practice and allows us to be more um, available to the clients when we actually meet with them, allows us to have a plan and allows us to really tell the story of what it is that we are trying to do. It also helps us know where the end is. I think that one of the other uh, areas of, of concern is that we often get involved in working with individuals. There's a specific problem articulated in the beginning, and our documentation really needs to reflect our work towards resolving that problem. But if we are not clear in our documentation, and if we are not able to be uh, critical thinkers and, and planning our work, then we can end up often being involved with folks for a longer period of time because something else will come up. I think that this is uh, common across all of our areas of practice, whether we're working in protective services, whether we're working in community social work or uh, child welfare. Um, life happens to the folks with whom we are working. And as social workers, we're often then tempted to begin to, to work on another problem and another problem. And so really ensuring that you're thinking critically about why you're there, what is your role, that you're evaluating progress, and that you are 
uh, consistently thinking about this in the way that you are documenting your work with the individual it can really be helpful in understanding when you have reached the point where uh, your work with this person is finished. It doesn't mean that they don't need additional services or um, guidance from somebody else, but I think it's really uh, helpful in helping us understand when we have uh, done what we have, uh, what we have been called to do. And clearly, it's also helpful for supervisors and for managers who can review documentation to get a greater understanding of the strengths and challenges of their workforce and can provide additional assistance with making sure that the social workers have the skills that they need in order to be able to do the work that we are asking them to do. So for all of these reasons, documentation is really important. You know, it's like showing your work, it's demonstrating uh, your critical thinking in action, and it's really uh, developing the path that you're going to use in your work with the individual. Next slide. One of the things that uh, is true, again, of, of many of our services is that it's not just an internal review of documentation, but the certainly when we are working in protective services, um, we have what becomes an official record. That record can be um, called into court for testimony or it can be opened up for other individuals uh, outside of our system to review. Um, it's essential then that we have uh, good documentation, clean documentation, clear documentation that um, tells the story, that it uh, is very explicit in why particular referrals were made or in fact were not made, and it allows us to um, be very clear about why we were making the decisions that we were making. Again, um, allows us to identify patterns um, either across the individual social workers or teams or agency practice. I also think it helps us nationally in terms of benchmarking if we were able to be very clear about what good documentation, clear documentation looks like and supports the continued uh, professionalization of our field and the justification for why we are uh, essential in what we do and how we do it and what differentiates us from other folks who are also involved in this particular arena. Um, next slide. It's really important as we think about uh, documentation that we also are very clear with our staff that there is a responsibility that comes from our field of practice. Um, there is a responsibility that comes from uh, certainly the National Association of Social Workers for Social Workers and for other governing bodies that set standards for our documentation. Um, the NASW code certainly tells us that, that social workers need to take reasonable steps to ensure that documentation and records is accurate and that it reflects the services provided. Um, it's really important to document the purpose of all the things that we do. It's important to document assessments and evaluations and recommendations. Um, and consultations with other folks should also be well documented to really prevent, to, to really provide a comprehensive picture of the work that has been done. It's, uh, as we all know, it's, it's unethical and harmful to the client and certainly poses a liability risk to the social worker to have documentation that is, that is false, that is inaccurate or is misleading. Unethical to alter case notes after the fact or to change anything in our, our past entry. NASW also speaks to timely um, uh, documentation that uh, has to be uh, close to the time in which the service was delivered and that it needs to um, be sufficient and that there has to be enough information to allow a reasonable individual looking at that documentation to understand uh, what the work is that was being done. I believe that it's equally important that um, not only are we documenting well in our case records, but that as supervisors and managers that we are documenting well in our supervision, um, the work that we are doing with our staff to demonstrate how we are supporting staff and to demonstrate that we are reviewing the work that they are doing and that there's just this entire sort of quality assurance cycle, making sure that 
throughout our organization, we have checks and balances to understand where things are working and where we're doing well, and also to understand where there may be some challenges and some things that we might want to look at and be doing a bit differently. Next slide. Clearly, um, depending upon where we are in the country, we have um, other folks who are looking at the work that we do and who are uh, imposing their own uh, specific guidelines on us. So as we look at how we develop documentation policies, as we look at the ways in which we want to um, train our staff to provide documentation, we have to take into consideration our federal, state and local guidelines. Um, clearly, um, there are APS standards that we, we can and should be uh, adhering to. And uh, some of us uh, in, who are less fortunate have possibly been involved with litigation or that we are, uh, our agencies in some ways have some other oversight, either court oversight or special masters who are looking at the way in which we do this work and making sure that our documentation again is sufficient. Um, it's somewhat problematic for me in, the, in, in many of these instances, the documentation is much more directed towards counting, counting numbers, counting the widgets, rather than um, um, really looking for thoughtful, uh, clinically uh, insightful documentation that speaks to the work that the social worker is doing to enhance resiliency with the individual and help them to resolve their issues. But I believe that it's certainly our responsibility within organizations to make sure that there is a balance between those two things. And again, that the, the documentation is, is providing a full picture of what is actually happening with the individuals. Um, again, uh, for those who are not familiar with the NASW, certainly has standards for supervision. And uh, it speaks to the importance of documentation. And in fact, that documentation is an important tool that verifies that you have provided supervision to uh, to your staff and that uh, it's really important that supervisors in turn assist the individuals that they are supervising to learn how to properly document client services and that, that they are uh, reviewing uh, these regularly during their supervision times. The supervision sessions, uh, and, and certainly I've always encouraged um, the individuals that I supervise to, to document their, their supervision with me as I document what I am I'm doing with them. I, we, we have very sort of specific formats that we use to do supervision. And certainly when I'm, I'm finished uh, my supervision sessions, I make copies of those and provide it to the supervisors. Again, it's another way of just really making sure that you are supporting your staff. It makes sure that if there are important things that are happening or changing in practice, that you are documenting that you have had those conversations with individuals, um, that they're clear what they need to be doing. And it gives them something to refer back to when they want to make sure that they have clearly understood what it is that you're asking them to do. Next slide. I have had many conversations with individuals where, again, they have looked at documentation as something that is separate and aside from the actual work of meeting with clients, talking with clients, um, working on, on case plans, etc. cetera. Um, I think it's in some ways the same attitude that we've had about data uh, for, for some time in the profession where it's something that we, we are forced to do, but it's not really our friend. I have really tried in, in my work uh, in social work uh, to, to have social workers reframe their thinking around documentation and to really think of the ways in which documentation can be helpful to them uh, in their practice. Again, it comes back to the process of critical thinking, to be really um, thoughtful about the work that we're doing rather than simply showing up and not really having a plan for the work that you're going to do in that particular session or with a particular individual. Reflective, doc, reflective thoughtful uh, process helps us to be better at our work uh, and it helps us see where we're doing well and where we're struggling. I think that if we do this consistently, consistently, and if we ask our staff to do this consistently and speak about it in 
either individual supervision or group supervision, that we can really elevate our practice and see documentation as a tool that can be very helpful to us. In fact, can be time saving as opposed to uh, taking up extra time in our day. Good documentation and when you fall into a rhythm with a format that you are comfortable with and that, that, that becomes uh, second nature to you, can really help you in organizing your thoughts, organizing your work and really structuring um, how you're going to do the work. And so again, it's not just talking about documentation as something that you have to do because we're required to do this for um, you know, for various purposes, it's about how do you really think about documentation as something that is your tool that allows you to um, do your work in a way that um, maximizes your opportunity to be successful and really helps you with time management. I think that, that when, when folks get to that point themselves, when they begin to really experience documentation that way, you can see a real shift in, in, in the ways in which they do the documentation and um, how they talk about it during supervision and during uh, case staffings. Next slide. So what is documentation? Well, it's identifying and gathering information. Next slide. I can't hear you laughing, so I'm hoping that at least some of you are, are um, uh, chuckling <laughs> this <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> On a Friday afternoon. Um, yes, I, I'm sure that most of us, many of us, have been in have been in this situation. Next slide. Documentation. So I've talked a lot about why we should do documentation. Why I think documentation is helpful in our practice and this whole idea of uh, critical thinking with our documentation. So I think that there are some, some very um, clear elements that we can look at um, <clears throat> that will help us in our, uh, developing a documentation format that works for us. Um, as, as I've said already, I believe that proficient documentation really moves us uh, forward in our work with individuals. I think it helps us to justify uh, resources and services. It helps us if we have to testify in court. Um, it also um, um, helps shape the, the trajectory that a client has through our system. So effective documentation really has to be these things. It has to be objective, it has to be accurate, it certainly has to be clear, it has to be relevant, and it has to be concise. So in terms of being objective, I mean clearly, Whatever it is that you write about that individual, um, it has to be uh, without bias or without prejudice. Um, our case records need to very concisely record what the worker is seeing, hearing, and experiencing, um, and it should document in a factual uh, manner. Um, it has to be accurate. The statements that we write have to be precise and truthful. And that comes down to simple things uh, Spelling of names, checking of facts, um, not necessarily using too much jargon uh, in, our, in our documentation. Um, it has to be clear. You know, there is the, uh, I think, the, the man at the bus stop analogy or the, the woman at the bus stop analogy that an individual, a regular individual, could uh, pick up the record and could clearly understand what was being. Uh, the story that we were trying to tell from this documentation. If, in fact, you're able to get clinical notes, documentation that is objective, accurate, and clear, you are uh, halfway to being really successful at this process, I believe. Next slide. Again, some additional points. You really not everyone writes well. Not everyone uh, finds writing a particular easy task. Um, and so I think sometimes when we start to talk to folks about documentation and all of these things that we're looking for in documentation, they become anxious um, and worry that they are not, um, they're not going to be able to do what it is that we want them to do. I think it's really useful if you are thinking about um, 
changing the format uh, in which you provide documentation or even just sort of reviewing um, how you currently do it to have very good examples of what you believe the documentation should look like um, and that it really can be fairly uh, short notes. I don't think that we really need to have you know pages and pages um, and in fact I found the the opposite to be true that when we have gone from a system where people are allowed to document just in any way that they want to something like this which is sort of uh, a much more prescribed way of documentation that we have gone from seeing pages and pages um, to a much shorter clearer concise uh, contact note and some of that is because that we can uh, I find that social workers that we can get caught up in doing a lot of description and um, it's really not it's it's useful to a certain extent and perhaps the first couple of notes you want to have much more description about what something actually looks like or what a home looks like or what the client is looking like or um, you know some of that environmental piece but as you go through you want to be able to capture that much more concisely and and move much more quickly to um, to the documentation format next slide so here's here's a uh, here's what I believe the process of documentation should should uh, be looking like now again we're talking now about documentation as part of the actual work of um, the APS worker um, part of the what you need to be thinking about before you get to that visit. So you're preparing for this contact, you're engaging in the contact. The question of can I take notes there and then comes up all the time. I think that uh, certainly if you are comfortable um, with note taking when you're sitting with a client and having that conversation and you can talk to the client in a way that um, doesn't your attention isn't wondering if you're taking notes and the client is, is okay with you taking notes I think that is fine um, if not you can jot down a few keywords I have someone on, on my staff currently who really needs to be a graphic artist I think because um, um, she will come back and I look at her notebook and, and there's circles and squares and little clouds and one words and it, it, it is it's very interesting to me I can't follow a word of it um, but when she puts it down in a contact note, it makes absolute sense. And so this is her way of really capturing key words and capturing them, them with sort of visual elements that help her to understand um, what she was thinking in that moment and to capture it later. Um, so we're not all that talented, but I do think that you know people need to find their the way that is comfortable for them in terms of getting this information in a in a format that they can then. Uh, turn into a contact note when they are able to get back to the office and do so. Again, documenting with time for, within time frames. Um, here in DC, our documentation policy is that you have to document any contact within 24 hours. Um, within 24, so if you do it sooner, that's better, um, but it has to be done within that time frame. Clearly, we're always debriefing with supervisors around what it is that we're doing, reviewing, providing feedback, and then um, supervisory input and coaching and now all of these steps don't happen all the time but in general this is the context in which documentation sits in the the world of the, uh, the caseworker and the supervisory relationship and then preparing for the next contact if you write your contact notes well if you're documenting appropriately got the format then you're already preparing for the next contact as you are finishing this note so it's a very continuous process and again really helpful to you in your work rather than just being something that you have to do because it's uh, it's part of the process. Um, next slide please. So we, we covered the question of why document and so really now we have to cover the uh, uh, area of what exactly is it that we are documenting. Next slide. So um, there are multiple formats. Um, actually, I'm sorry, can we go back one slide? No, 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 going the wrong way. Can we go back? Back one, there we go. Talks of types of documentation. I just wanted to make sure I was clear about that. Um, I think there's a full documentation process that has to be used specifically for face-to-face -face visits. 
probably for longer phone calls or emails. However, it doesn't mean that you have to use the same format every time, every uh, every uh, small contact that you have with individuals, although you do have to make sure that you document those things. And so um, uh, a very brief email about medication changing gets documented. It doesn't need to get documented in the full format that I'm going to talk to you about in a moment. We also have to uh, be clear about the elements that we're asking uh, to have included in the documentation. And so for me, that's the date and the time and the location of the contact, it's the purpose. It's all the things that all of you already know, I'm sure, um, who was there, who was present um, during the interaction. Did you have any concerns around safety? Um, were you able to engage with the individual? Brief description, I think because description comes easily to us and people are really comfortable with it, you can get a much uh, sort of uh, elongated description rather than that should be a short part of your documentation and really um, the other pieces uh, such as the assessment and the plan need to be um, more fleshed out. Uh, general discussion of what happened, uh, clearly we're always doing assessment, particularly in protective services, every time we visit with someone we're thinking about safety, we're thinking about assessment. And then, of course, any any new information or any follow up. Okay, next slide, please. Um, in and certainly in my years in social work, we've gone through multiple different kinds of documentation format, um, all of which have their uses and uh, you know are suitable for different uh, environments. The one that the I have settled on and that um, I now use is the one that you'll see here at the bottom of this slide, which is the PCAP um, format. That is a slide that um, I've worked on uh, in the district um, in, uh, in other agencies um, and uh, have now brought to the Department of Aging and Community Living as, a, as the format that we use internally and across our senior network. So we're spend the rest of the time talking about this format, which is the purpose content assessment plan. And really, you know, that just that just tells you everything right there. This is this is what we expect our, our notes to look like. So what what does this mean? Next slide. Purpose content assessment plan. This is really, if you have all of these items in your contact note, you have gone, you know, 95% of the way as far as I'm concerned of getting all of the relevant information, telling me what I need to know, uh, keeping you on track with your work with this individual, and then uh, having documentation that will stand up when other individuals begin to look at it. So let's look at purpose. Next slide. Purpose. The contact note has to begin with the purpose. Why am I there? What is it that I seek to achieve during this visit? This is, uh, and this should be in the context of what the initial uh, uh, or ongoing concerns were related to danger and risk. So. Um, Again, we have a referral that has indicated why this individual has been brought to the attention of Adult Protective Services. When I first go out, my initial contact note should tie my purpose in being in that home or that situation to the referral and the allegation, and then I work on from there. Uh, so again, you know, as we see here, um, purpose of this visit to gather information to complete my uh, structured decision making assessment that could be it could be to gather information to complete an assessment uh, i could state that my purpose was to engage the client in discussing the allegation and developing a service plan um, if it's later on in my work with an individual i could say that the purpose of this visit was to engage the client in monitoring progress towards safe case closure. Um, or um, perhaps I would say that it's to provide crisis intervention and assist the client in 
problem solving or, or crisis resolution. I mean, it really is basically a one or two sentence statement that tells me right from the beginning why the social worker, why the APS worker has engaged in this contact at this point in time. So now that I have the purpose, I will move on to the content. Next slide. Content, again, as we talked earlier in this presentation, objective information. This is the who, what, where, and, and how of the contact. And this is, this is sort of the part that I think most people are really comfortable with. Um, we're also talking here about how we're engaging and partnering. Um, certainly talking about uh, the, uh, the things that we're doing, if there are any uh, initial safety concerns or, or newly emerging concerns, this would be um, related in this section. Um, information gathered about uh, assessments and then, you know, if we're making any uh, referrals. Um, this really should be strengths-based, um, but again, using critical thinking is very important here. Uh, have the work of structure, what it is that we are trying to do. Um, it should be concrete. Uh, information should be um, um, very clearly laid out here. And, um, and this is also a place where we would talk about um, strengths and assets of, of the client and their extended network. So now we've, uh, we've had our purpose and we've talked about content. And then we move on to uh, the, the third uh, piece of the documentation process, and that is assessment. Next slide. Yeah. Assessment. This is really, I think, of the, of the uh, four parts of this um, documentation format. This is a really important piece probably for me the, the most important piece of, of these four pieces. Assessment is really, it's the worker's overall impression of the contact. Um, it includes, you know, how the content is really related to the service plan components. You're talking about goals here. Um, this demonstrates if, if your worker is really able to organize, synthesize and, and analyze all of the information that has been gathered regarding um, regarding the individual safety, regarding you know protective capacity, danger, risk, um, what's working well, and what is not. This is really an important part of this documentation process, and it's an area where um, the individual's critical thinking and their their skills in that field really um, can be. You know, very well demonstrated when they write assessment, or as a supervisor, if I'm looking at contact notes and looking at assessments, and I'm not seeing the ability to do those things to, you know, to include this uh, process of, of organizing their thoughts and work and, and analyzing and synthesizing the, the information, that really gives me a lot to work with with the individual, with my worker, to really help them think about how they structure this process. We don't get that much time in protective services to work with our clients. And so every contact is really important. Every interaction is really important. And it's really um, the, the more facile a social worker, an APS worker is at um, getting that information, really making good, um, thoughtful assessments in a, in a fairly you know, time limited manner, I think the more effective our interventions can be. So again, I really think that this piece of the work is certainly one of the most important pieces of the work for me. I think it's one of the ones that we probably don't do as well in as the other pieces. And I think it really provides fertile ground for working with, uh, working with the, the uh, social workers to get them to a place where they are uh, much more comfortable in, in quickly uh, determining um, the work that needs to be done with this individual, how to bring that work together, how to structure it well, um, how to organize it in, the, in a way that makes sense in terms of priorities, and then how to um, move towards, uh, again, safe case closure, which is the goal that we're looking for in the, in the majority of our cases. Next slide. Yes. So again, I think this is. I think I've made the the points here that this is really assessment is assessment is just key to to what we're doing, uh, and particularly 
the idea of every time someone enters the home or any time we have that um, ability to have contact with the client, it's an opportunity to uh, assess uh, safety and to assess protective capacity and to ensure that we are um, uh, helping to uh, uh, increase resiliency in that individual and in their network. Next slide. So after all of those things, after we've done all that hard work, we have initiated the contact, we've had a plan for why we are there, we've had the um, description of uh, the, what we see and what we do when we get there, and then we have an assessment of what all of this means to us. Finally, we get to the place where we are able to develop a plan. And again, um, the plan can be, it can be really simple, not writing the next great American novel, it can be bullet points, one, two, and three, it's what are we doing, what are the next steps here, what do I need to do to move this along? Um, as to be specific, um, you know, a generic uh, will we'll get a um, social security card. Well, who's going to get the social security card? Am I going to get the social security card? Is the client going to do it? Is the client's daughter going to do it? So let's be really clear about what it is that we're doing here. And then again, expectations regarding um, the, the time frames and the, the action steps and who's going to be accountable for these things. Um, I think, as I said earlier, it, it becomes challenging for us to know when we have reached the end if we don't know what the end is when we started. We receive a call for adult protective services around a particular allegation, or it could be more than one allegation, but there are some particular things that someone is concerned about in the life of a vulnerable adult. Our work is to investigate, determine whether or not that is true, determine what steps, if any, we need to take in order to help ensure safety. Again, I would say also to increase resiliency in the individual and connecting them to um, other referral sources and other networks as necessary. The plan needs to speak to those things. And if during your work with the individual, you're not able to think critically, you haven't been really clear about where the end is, you're never going to be able to organize yourself and organize your thoughts and organize your work with that individual um, to get you there in a way that makes sense for folks, that is really sort of time-bound and organized and stands the best chance for you to be successful and for that individual to be successful. So that really is like, it's how I frame this work um, for my staff currently. Um, and it is um, really, for me, the, the, the driving force be, behind trying to uh, get folks to think about documentation, again, not just as an add-on or uh, addendum to the, to the actual work, as someone described it to me the other day, but as a really integral part of the work, which facilitates our ability to do the work in a way that makes more sense. Next slide. Um, I think that when you think about it, if we are changing our documentation, if we need to either tweak the format that we currently have or whether we need to shift to a different format, then you have to think about these things. Um, clearly, you know, you start with what is working well. Like, what are we doing? If, you, if your documentation does all of this um, or, or what you feel that it needs to do in order to get you to the place where the work is done in a way that really is efficient and effective and you're getting the results that you want, then clearly um, you're, you're, you're good to go. Um, if you are not, then the question is really, what are you worried about? Um, do you have questions, um, gray areas in your documentation that you would like to, to clean up? Um, what strengths and knowledge and skills do you think that your team currently have? Um, and then what are those that they would need in order to, to shift their policy? Um, into doing a different different kind of documentation. Um, so that really is that's the question to be asked as we think about uh, as we think about the process. I think for me that this format, that the the PCAP format, um, really um, prompts the application of critical thinking and clinical knowledge um, across case practice. Um, here in the District of Columbia, the adult protective services teams rest within the um, the Department of Aging and Community Living, and so we have adult protective services teams, but we also have community social work teams, we have nursing home 
uh, transition teams, everyone is now using this format and thinking about um, you know, the skills that are necessary uh, in case practice to, um, to engage with folks, to assess well, to plan well, and then to really move uh, individuals uh, to safe case closure wherever they have entered into our system. And as you think about that, there are some, some additional sort of things that I think one needs to think about. Next slide. Clinical knowledge and skills. I mean, really, that, um, as I've, I've said, I think that critical thinking is a skill that is essential to us as, uh, as uh, adult protective service workers, uh, as really as social workers in general. And so really thinking about, um, you know, those higher order thinking skills and how do we uh, uh, conduct sound assessments that support, you know, good decision making and effective case planning. So quality documentation really uh, requires that, that the folks that we are working with um, are able to, to think about these things as they are doing the documentation and as they are looking to um, describe specific outcomes um, that they believe will resolve whatever the issue is that has brought this individual to our attention. And um, it really reflects their analysis uh, of the, the situation. Next slide. We have to persuade people that documentation doesn't take <laughs> three hours and that it really is a worthwhile uh, part of our, our work. Uh, next slide. Um, this is just a, this is just helpful for me always as I think about um, the PCAP documentation. This this just really is a, a sort of memory aid, a job aid that I share with staff that uh, helps keep us on track as we're doing this documentation. Um, it, it supports the shift, I think, towards quality documentation, very reflective of quality of contacts and good uh, uh, case practice. Next slide. I think that um, it's important to be reflective in our work as we do this. I think that uh, quality of documentation um, across our case practice activities uh, promotes the opportunity for us as adult protective service professionals to review what we do, to uh, critically examine the ways in which we do this work, um, to really help ourselves in terms of, sort of self-coaching and self-awareness, and it helps uh, our social workers and managers to be as supportive um, as they are able with our staff to really develop and grow folks into uh, being uh, uh, stronger in the way that they are doing this work. Um, it just, it's really important uh, implications, I think, in terms of informing supervisory uh, practice and administrative needs and really serves to, to help me as a manager overall think about the, the needs of my organization and uh, training, etc. Next slide. Again, uh, uh, an aid that I give to my staff, which really helps them think about um, how to uh, use uh, this format. Next slide. An aid specific to the um, to the elements of the PCAP. Um, if they use the questions uh, in this protocol as a guide, it helps them. Uh, assess whether or not they're really um, using the format accurately and it helps uh, frame the discussion with supervisors if they need some additional assistance. Um, next slide. Next slide. And this is for supervisors in the group. So again, uh, just as workers, uh, I think, should be reflective of practice in our documentation, uh, it's um, important for supervisors to be reflective and thoughtful and um, coach our staff on how best to do this work. Um, next slide. Is another slide, are we done? Yeah, we're done. Great. Okay.
Thank you, Heather, so much. I think that was some really wonderful, helpful information. Um, so we have some time for some questions. If you have not typed your question into the question box and one po popped up to you while Heather was speaking, um, go ahead and type those in the question box now and we will get to as many as we can before our end time. But we do have a few already. Um, so here's one question. This might be a little bit of a tough one. Do you have suggestions that would help workers be more internally driven to improve their documentation practices um, as far as you know, being current, clear, and concise? And again, do you have suggestions that would help workers be more internally driven to improve their documentation? I think you have to see, you have to see how something can be helpful to you. So um, I think that that requires a relationship with the supervisor um, or perhaps that someone in a training unit, whatever your setup is, that can really have this reflective conversation with folks about how they really feel about documentation, is documentation something that, that they don't like to do or it just takes up too much time, and then talking about how this can really help you organize your work. It helps us organize our work, it helps us manage our time better, and really it presents you in a, a very strong light when um, your supervisor or anybody else is looking at your work. I mean, this is now part sure. of what we use for our evaluation process as well. Yeah, great. Very good advice. Um, our next question, how do you address staff that over-document? And this is something that can be very subjective, this person says. So how do you address staff that can over-document? I guess this is the people who write the book for each home visit. Yeah, the people who write the book. I think it comes back to where they over-documenting. Um, mm. Critical thinking, uh, and that's a, you know, that's a whole other, we could spend another hour thinking about what is critical thinking and how do we encourage critical thinking. Certainly. And critical thinking really is about, can you succinctly identify the issues um, um, and analyze the information and develop a plan. Uh, again, I think that most of us are much more comfortable with writing, you know, a page and a half in the description of what's mm -hmm. going on and two lines on the assessment. And so if that's what the person's doing, helping them become more succinct with what the description, what are the critical elements of the description? I don't need to know, you know, all these 10, 15 things you've told me. Which are the two or three points that are really critical that would then lead into the assessment, lead into the plan. Mm -hmm. And I would literally, I, I mean, we've done this before, we've said, you, look, three things. I don't want you to tell me more than three things because those are the three things you'll work on. Because if you, you're trying to work on more than three things, then, you, you know, you start to get, it gets, yeah. starts to get overwhelming. Yeah, it gets to be too much. Great. Yeah. Um, this is a good one. In regards to a crisis or an emergency incident, how do you continue to follow the documentation formats when the visit may be chaotic with paramedics, fire department, police, et cetera, in one home visit. And again, during a crisis or emergency incident, how do we continue to follow the documentation formats when things may be a bit chaotic? Yeah, I think that when people have done it for a period of time, they automatically have that, you know, uh, peak up thing in their head. And when they start to write notes, it comes out. I think the important thing is, to, I mean, clearly we're going to debrief the crisis with the individual and get the salient information. And some of this is, can be done in supervision, right? You can ask the questions where you can really drive the conversation, make the notes and say, hey, you know, if I were documenting it in, in the peak up format, here's what I would come up with and then help them with that. I mean, at that moment in time, is documentation the most important thing? No. Right. This yep. is for the like, managing to the middle, right? For 80% of our work, it's okay, but there's occasions where clearly it's not and, and don't force it. Yep, yep. And APS deals with, you know, people's lives sometimes, yep. Um, yep. and that, that's definitely going to trump it. So great advice. Um, so this question involves investigative documentation versus non-investigative documentation. So a client interview versus assessing someone for appropriate services. And when you think about the two, would you make a distinction and are there any better practices between the two? So again, investigative documentation like interviewing a client and then non-investigative documentation like assessing for services, would you make a distinction in the documentation? Not really. I mean, I think that this format can be used uh, either way. I mean, if, if the purpose is to conduct an assessment, you're going to go out there and you're going to ask the questions, but you're still going to look at, you know, mm -hmm. the, 
your assessment of, of how that assessment went or the questions that they answered and then a plan of what you're going to do with the assessment. So yep. I think it's fully applicable. Yep. Great. Yep. Um, another question, this is a good one as well. What are your thoughts on acronyms and abbreviations? Should agencies have a authorized or approved list of acronyms and abbreviations for case notes? Yes. I mean, we all do it. You have to, but you have to have a standard list, and you have to give that out to people when they first join your organization, and then somebody has to be responsible for updating it at least on a quarterly basis, yep. so that we're all and using the same thing. Yep, yep. So everybody knows what the acronyms mean. We can yep. have a lot of acronyms in our practice. Yeah, we do. Um, another good one, and I've always wondered this myself. What are your thoughts regarding staff cutting and pasting emails into <laughs> documentation? No. So, Directly cutting and pasting emails into case notes. Where we are, um, that is forbidden uh, here. Just, just like whiteout. You can't use whiteout either because you know that whole you never know what before or after. Yep. Um, it on the on the, as you see on the advice of my attorney, um, we have <laughs> made the determination <laughs> here that it's not appropriate to cut and paste information. That you can certainly summarize the information. You know, I had a telephone call with um, G. Smith. Um, he suggested that the conversation, re you know, resulted in this, um, yep. rather than uh, cutting and pasting everything that's said. Yep. Great. Emails never go. Somebody said this to me. I do this because then I have the evidence that it happened. Well, the reality is that emails never go away, even when you think you've deleted it. It's still out there somewhere. So in the event right. that you actually needed this for a trial or for some other activity, we could we could uh, find it. Yep. Yep. This is very true. Yeah. Um, and I believe you may have mentioned this or alluded to this earlier. What is the best timeline for entering documentation? One day, two days, three days? We do it within 24 hours. 24 I think hours. 48 hours is also permissible, but once you go beyond that, uh, particularly if you have, you know, high or, you know, medium high caseloads, then you begin to run the danger of things, uh, important things slipping. Yep. Yep. We're all forgetful sometimes. Mm -hmm. Um and what are your thoughts on a documentation template? Um, I think it's fine. Yeah. I mean, in essence, what, what I have is a template. Um, we just we don't have it sort of set into the system, but people do the. You can see when you read their notes, it says P, and then it has the purpose. It says C, right? So it's yep. it really is. Help save some time. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, uh, I think our time is up for today. I would like to thank Dr. Stowe for all this wonderful information on documentation. It's a good um, set of information for brand new workers and a good refresher for people who've been in the field for a long time. And it's one of those fundamentals that's really key to working in social services, especially APS. So thank you so much, Dr. Stowe. We really appreciate Thank all you. the information you've given us today. Thanks to everybody. Oh, next slide. Um, we appreciate your participation today in the webinar. If you would like to reach out to the APS TARC, here is our contact information. You have our web address there, apstarc.acl.gov. And you also have our email address if you'd like to copy that down. Again, these slides are available if you want to download them now. In the handout section of your go to webinar control panel, you can also just Google APS TARC, and that's TARC with a C, and reach us. And um, feel free to reach out to us anytime. Um, if you have any questions about your APS practice, that's why we're here to help. So thanks so much, everyone, for your attendance today, uh, and have a great weekend. Thank you, Annie. Thank you, Dr. Stowe.